Welcome to this service from the Church of Ireland, St Nicholas in Adair, County Limerick, with the churches of Croom, Kilpeacon and Kilmallock. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But what does John mean by the Word? In fact, that is one of the greatest debates of biblical scholarship. In the original Greek that he used, the Logos is translated in our Bibles as the Word. But translation can be problematic because despite that conventional translation of Logos, it was not actually used to connote a word in the grammatical sense. When John speaks of Jesus as the Logos, the Word, he is conveying something different, something more nuanced and quite particular. And what impact might this then have on the way we read Scripture? And what impact might it have on the way we view the man Jesus? And so we start our service. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. God of creation, shaper of seas and stars, of planets and of people, Lord have mercy. Jesus born in poverty, gurgling and crying, and laid in a manger. Christ have mercy. Spirit of love, breath of the universe, flickering, dancing in the candle flame. Lord have mercy. Christ is a light, illumine and guide us. Christ is a shield, overshadow and hold us. Christ below us, Christ above us. Christ beside us on our left and our right. Christ as a light, Christ as a shield. Christ be with us on our left and our right. And so we pray. Almighty God, you have created the heavens and the earth and made us in your own image. Teach us to discern your hand in all your works and your likeness in all your children, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who with you in the Holy Spirit reigns supreme over all things, now and for ever. Amen. We now hear the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light, the true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, and yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. 
and the Word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of a Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. Here ends the reading. The prologue of John's Gospel is probably the most densely written, multi-layered, textured and richly symbolic passages in the Bible. It continues to challenge, perplex and divide scholars to this day, who still struggle to agree upon the identity of the writer, the time and context of writing, the message it was intended to convey, as opposed to the interpretations that we might infer, whether the writer had access to the other Gospels or had just heard some sections read out, or had heard the stories passed down by other sources, but had never encountered the other Gospels at all. There is also continuing debate as to the extent to which John's Gospel seeks to report an accurate history of actual events in Jesus' life, or is more creative and imaginative. In ancient biography, there was less of a distinction between what we might call factual and fictional elements. Whereas works of the lives of politicians and military leaders tended to stick more closely to historical events, accounts of the lives of philosophers, religious leaders and holy men were more idealised and would also feature legendary traditions, imagined character traits, and even fabricated anecdotes. But in this they would have seen little that was inappropriate or reprehensible, for what mattered was for the biography to paint a picture, to give an artist's impression that was compelling, inspiring and motivating to the reader, or much more likely the listener to reflect back what they had come to believe about the person, how they now viewed them, who they had become to those who now venerated them, rather than the person's actual friends, family and contemporaries might have recognised them, and not least the person themselves. In this we might recognise the distinction between what some scholars might call the pre-Easter and the post-Easter Jesus, or perhaps one might say the Jesus who was known to those who encountered him in life and the Christ who later came to be revered and seen as divine, in part through the witness of the Gospel of John and the stories that came to be told about him. Prior to the events of Easter, Jesus was a Jewish rabbi and mystic with radical and subversive insight, a disruptor of conventional and atrophied thinking. Also clearly a gifted leader and teacher, the master of the succinct phrase that helped people to see the ordinary in extraordinary ways. A prophet in the Jewish tradition at the same time continuity, but also a discontinuity. And someone whose entire life was focused on what he called the Kingdom of God, an end of this world ruled by human systems of domination, subjugation and injustice, transformed instead into a vision of compassion, mercy equity and righteousness. So an exceptional human being, probably the most exceptional man who has ever lived, certainly by our estimation. And after Easter, what Marcus Borg calls the post-Easter Jesus, he takes on new and mystical meaning in a way that possibly neither Jesus nor his contemporaries could have imagined. The emerging Christian community begins to speak of him as light of the world, light of light, saviour, lord of lords. 
And there is an evolution, a process by which perception of Jesus the man who existed in time and not widely exhorted in his life, changes in the mind of the Christian community that is emerging. It helps perhaps to see the process almost like waves running up the shore, each wave, each statement about Jesus reaching higher up the sand until the water surrounds us. The man who existed in time becomes the person who existed before all time. And I'll say that again. The man who existed in time becomes the person who existed before all time. By the time John is writing, at the end of the first century, he clearly intends that the whole of his Gospel will be read in this context. That whilst we shall hear of Jesus the man and his ministry, John sees Jesus not so much in terms of a prophet, or a holy man, or even as the expected Messiah, but the divine and eternal cosmic reality of which Jesus is a part. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. So how are we to decipher this? On the one hand, we are very familiar with the passage. It is, after all, one of the main readings to be used around Christmas, and it is the culmination of nine lessons and carols where we reflect on a new chapter, the start of a journey, the start of a ministry. But like much of scripture that is so familiar, we can hear and appreciate the poetry without fully understanding the symbolisms locked inside. What does John mean by the word? In fact, that is one of the greatest debates of biblical scholarship. In the original Greek that he used, the logos, the word, eternally, before time, in time, and after time. Translation can be problematic, however, because despite the conventional translation of Logos in English as word, it was not actually used to connote a word in the grammatical sense. The original Greek word for that was lexis. Now, both Logos and Lexis derive from the same verb Lego, so they are related, but the connotations are different. Lexis does mean word in the way that we say, now what's the word? You know the word. It's on the tip of my tongue. But when John speaks of Jesus as the Logos, the word, he is conveying something different, something more nuanced and quite particular. As a term, it is closer to another word, logic, and the verb to reason, and in a deeper sense, meaning. So let us try the first sentence of the prologue in this way. In the beginning, was meaning, and the meaning was with God, and the meaning was God. Meaning was in the beginning with God. In logotherapy, we speak of three levels of meaning that can make up what the ancient Greeks called eudaimonia, literally good spirit, essentially a good, fulfilled, and righteous human life. The first level of what meaning, and one that we can all and should strive for, is to discover what might be called the meaning of the moment. 
to live our lives mindfully and purposefully, to uncover, even in the performance of mundane tasks and the ordinary stuff of life, how this moment might have meaning and importance. It may even be that we have to endure suffering that is unavoidable, that our lives are not always free, that we cannot always choose the circumstances under which we must labour. But even in those times we still have one freedom which cannot be taken away, the freedom to decide how we shall respond. Perhaps still to experience anguish and pain, but to do so with courage and dignity. Then there is the meaning of our lives. This is something to which we oh so slowly build, that may only be discerned at the end of our lives, as the threads and weaving patterns of our lives finally come together, but which is comprised of all the micro decisions, all the meanings of the moment that we have accumulated and treasured. We may not recognize the purpose of our lives in advance, but it is there, slowly being molded and created. And lastly, there is what we might call ultimate and universal meaning, that which subsumes and celebrates all of life, all of existence, past, present and future. We might also call this God, the very ground of being, that which is above, but also within, and suffuses all that was, is, and shall be. As St. Paul said, now we see through a glass darkly, then we shall see face to face. Now I know only in part, only then shall I know fully. It was this meaning, eternal, before all time and beyond all time, of which John was speaking, the cosmic unity and totality of which we believe Jesus was a part. He saw through the darkened glass. He knew, and not just in part, for he had transcended self to be at one with all and in all. That is the beauty, that is the truth, that is the meaning of the Trinity, into which we too are invited. Amen. We are pilgrims along the way of life. Let us therefore remind ourselves of the path of faith that has brought us to this time and place. We believe in God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God the Holy Spirit who strengthens us with power from on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us now pray for our church, for ourselves and neighbours, and for the needs of the whole world. God of creation, the earth is yours with all its beauty and goodness, its richness and overflowing provision. But we have claimed it for our own, plundered its beauty for profit, grabbed its resources for ourselves. Forgive us. May we no longer abuse your trust or the advantages that we enjoy, but care gently and with justice.
for your earth. Christ be with us, around and beside us. Help us to be at peace with each other, so that we may live together in harmony and justice, just as you hold the whole world in your hands, hold us too. Bless us with strength, fill us with love, and inspire us to care for one another and all that is. May we, your church, learn to live with your world, collaborating, not dominating, acknowledging that our privileged place does not extend to exploitation, destruction, and desecration. Christ be with us, around and beside us. Grant our leaders the courage to face and communicate unpalatable truths. May they place what is right before what is expedient or popular. Enable them to take the difficult decisions that are essential for all people, all creatures, all creation to live and thrive and grow. May they truly provide leadership in the face of changes that must be made, policies that must be devised, futures that must be imagined. Christ be with us, around and beside us. We pray for those who have departed this life and entered into the life beyond. May they know peace and contentment, the healing of wounds, the making whole of that which was broken, the realization of all that was hoped and longed for. May our prayers for them participate in that greater love that knows no bounds or limits. Christ be with us, around and beside us. We especially pray for the peoples of Ukraine, Russia, Palestine and Israel. We remember them now and hold them in our hearts in a moment of silence. Christ be within us, around and beside us. And now a few moments for our own concerns and prayers, for those on our hearts.
together we say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. The power and the glory. Forever and ever. Amen. May Christ, who draws the nations to himself, teach us to love our enemies. May Christ, who enters the water of baptism, lead us to die to all but love. May Christ, who gives new wine for the world, turn our bitterness into joy. And may the blessing of God, the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bringing peace beyond all understanding, be with you and remain with you and all whom you love, now and forever. Amen. Let us go in the peace of Christ. Thanks be to God. <laughs>